Good morning. Good morning, Beans Corner Baptist Church. Glad to see everyone out this morning on this uh, pretend spring day. It's uh, might as well be spring. That'd be nice. But <laughs> exactly, it's close. And like, it's, it didn't even get below freezing last night where I am. So like, that's pretty nice. But oh, well, I'm going to open this up in a word of prayer and then uh, you can join us in song. Dear Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this building that we have to be outside, uh, to be uh, inside from the weather and that we can have heat and just uh, survive in this climate. God, I thank you for the people that are here. I thank you for the fellowship that we have as believers and as friends. I just pray that we would uh, give everything we have in our worship this morning and that we would really uh, take to heart what you have to say to us this morning from Ira, and that we would really, uh, really search the scriptures and really understand what it is you're trying to say and really take it to heart. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Please stand as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You guys hear me? Yep, there. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who are visiting with us uh, for the first time or um, are uh, newcomers to the church in the last year, I wanted to give you a heads up between services. So if you show up a little bit early, uh, show up about 10 o'clock, um, there is breakfast served down in the fellowship hall, which is uh, off to the left here or in the right when you walk in. And there are red coffee cups. Uh, so if you are visiting with us and you go down and grab a cup of coffee, yes, right here. So grab one um, and uh, have a cup of coffee, and it just gives us a way of identifying you if you're new to us um, and uh, give us the opportunity to visit with you and welcome you to the church. 
Also, on your way out, uh, there is a welcome center, um, and somebody will be there. We have a gift for you, and there's also a Connect card. If you take a few minutes and fill that out, that would be wonderful. And for those of you who have been here for a while and maybe feel disconnected um, and would like to connect with us, uh, please use one of those as well. Uh, you can drop it in the offering plate, uh, or there's a basket right on the table in the, in the foyer. A couple quick announcements. Um, Cheese will be meeting on February 21st. Uh, from 11.30 to 1 o'clock uh, for all of our elders. Um, uh, so that is going to happen. And then additionally, uh, there is a warming center on Fridays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, so please feel free to join that. So Michelle has a couple announcements as well. Hello. Yes, the warming center's been great. We had 42 people this past Friday. So, yeah, so it's doing well. And God provides the food. It's just amazing. It, it always works out. I always fret, and no need to, really. So I have two announcements. Women's breakfast is this coming Saturday, and we've changed the time to 9 o'clock. So we kind of compromise. So 9 o'clock. So there's a sign-up sheet out back for food. And the other thing is Koinonia Adult Night Out. There is a little flyer in the bulletin this week, um, but it's Saturday the 24th, um, 5 o'clock, and it's not just for couples. So singles, young and old, are welcome to come, just no children, and we're encouraging people to get dressed up. Um, not that you absolutely have to. I don't want anybody going out to buy something new, but just... It's fun to get dressed up. At least us women think it's fun. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, the menu is going to be lasagna, but we'll have a meatless option and a dairy-free option for those people that need that. And um, we're asking, there's a sign-up sheet out there for pies for dessert. So uh, if people can sign up for that. And we want you to RSVP by next Sunday so we have a, a good head count, so we have enough food. And that's it. Who do I give this to? Have a good day, all. Two things. So uh, he said the cheese is for elders. I don't like his usage of that word. It's for 50 and, old, 50 and older. So just non, non, less elders. 50 and over. Yes, Anita? So on the back is a little history if you're interested in, in where it all came from. Uh, and... Uh, I'm really excited about dressing up for Coin tonight because I have a Hawaiian shirt with matching shorts. <laughs> and I, I haven't had any. I know on Sunday, but oops. Sorry, can't do both. I know. All right. Um, today, today at three o'clock, we're doing uh, three three o'clock study at three o'clock. See now, see I just you know that repetition helps remember. So three o'clock study. Uh, there's a lot going on in our world. A lot going on in our country. A lot of concern with the direction things are going and, and how do we respond to it. How does the church respond to it? A lot of angry people, a lot of shouting and division, all that stuff. What does the Bible say uh, about all that and about how we are supposed to engage and what God is calling us to as far as being an influence in our society and influence in the world and dealing with morality and immorality and all that cool stuff. So, three weeks. Part one today, 3 o'clock. I hope you'll come. It will not be streamed. We will record it, post it probably later, but we'd love to have you here. It's going to be down in the fellowship hall, very relaxed, uh, discussion, discovery, just kind of uh, some time. So hope you come 3 to 4, be about an hour uh, at most, and we'd love to have you here at 3. And uh, then Rick is Rick who's going to come, and uh, he has a presentation thing that he'd like to do. Good morning. <clears throat> I want you to think of a word this morning, and I want you to think hard on it. The name of it is influencer. Okay, we live in a society where we hear about it, people that influence others, and likes, dislikes, which is, I guess that's Facebook, or you, people like what you put out there, or people don't like what you put out there. So. I want to share a, a personal story about a, an influencer in my life, <clears throat> and then we're going to go public. So back in, and I, during the first service, I shared that, and I don't know if Ben Hatch is here. So Ben makes jokes about me, 
that I am one of the elder Lee of the church. And so I have to say, yeah, he's right. So I'm going to go back to 1976, my junior year at J High School, and tell a little story about someone that influenced my life. So it was a spring. It was baseball season, or about to be baseball season at J High School. And Mike Henry, who some of us know, Randy would know him, would have been there, um, was not only my junior high basketball coach, but he also was the high school football coach and high school baseball coach. So on this certain Saturday, we're heading to Kobe College for a clinic, baseball clinic. And four kids, I was 16 years old, 40 eight years ago, 46 years ago, a long time ago. And so we're, we're driving t towards Colby, and Jerry Remy and Mark Belanger, some of you might remember Jerry Remy, uh, were doing the clinic. So we're driving towards Colby, and senior in the front, two juniors in the back, and a sophomore, and a pretty girl is walking down the sidewalk. So the senior in the front rolls a window down and goes, and I had Mike in junior high, remember, and I'm a junior in high school, and I didn't know what was going to happen. He just turns around, and someone at first service says, that would not happen today. He grabbed him by the collar and pulled his head back into the, into the car, and his words were, first, you are representing your school, and also, you're mirroring what I'm teaching you. And... I was saying, you know, I don't remember things that two years ago happened in my life, but that was impacted me. And that's a coach. So this morning, I'm going to go public. And what I want to do <clears throat> is any of you that are t teachers, administrators, uh, school bus drivers, anybody that uh, substitute teachers that impact our kids and our influencers of young people, young adults, you might be, we had two professors at the first service, you might, um, you might help in a daycare, or you might run a daycare. Please stand up. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Just stand up. And we want to present you with just a small token of our appreciation and our love for you. So Lisa's going to come by, and she's just going to give you a, a, just a small gift. Uh, and what I want you to realize is four things. Because of God's great love for you. Also, anybody that's watching the stream uh, today, if you are any of those, please give Beth. Um, you can call the office. If you have Beth's uh, cell phone number, you can get a hold of her. We want to give you a gift also. What I want... Whoops. What I want to just relay is that four things. You are strong. You are worthy. You are love. And you are enough. So thank you so much. I'm just going to, don't sit. I'm going to just close in prayer and just pray over you today. Good morning, Father. Lord, we just thank you for I just thank you for these people that have just selflessly stand in the gap every day that they go to work. I just thank you for the influence that they have on their students or their, uh, there might be an administrator, Lord, that uh, is dealing with teachers or school boards. Um, Lord, just bless their lives. Lord, just give them the strength that they need to continue on and to know like Mike Henry did in my life, that these young people or these college-age students are impacted by their behavior, by their love, and by their desire to just continue to serve them. Just lift them up today, Lord, and give them a good week. We pray these things in your name. Amen. One final thing. Okay, so, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> One final thing, and we can continue on in the worship. Um, so this coming week is Valentine's Day, guys, Randy, 
Jerry, Rick. So just remember that. But beyond that, uh, so it'd be really great as parents that have kids in school. I don't have, I've, my kids have grown, but I have seven grandkids. So I am going to reach out to my three kids this week, this weekend, uh, and let them know. It would be great to just send a card with your kids to school just thanking their teacher. Or maybe it's that bus driver. I think bus drivers I've had in the, when I was a kid, and Freddie Willette was one of them that impacted me. Um, just give them a word of encouragement. You'll make their day. Thank you. When he first said influenza, I thought he said influenza. <laughs> We're going to take our offering now? If we have a couple of ushers? Yes. Oh, we, uh, yes. We do have one. This one? Oh. Uh, oh, bless this one? Go ahead. Do your thing. So, uh, Blessed Hands is donating to WIC, 47 birth cloths, 25 bibs, two Afghans, two, nine quilts, two fleece blankets, and to the animal shelter, five cat beds. So, appreciate um, Blessed Hands. We found a ring in the end of the hall, right side bathroom. If you're missing a ring. Oh, that's me, actually. All right. <laughs> Thank you. It has been found. <laughs> Missed your ch chance if you wanted a free ring. All right. <laughs> or he didn't miss a chance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please stand as we uh, continue your time of worship. Lift your voice, it's a year 
faultless to stand before the seat. Children, come on down. I'm exchanging long, meaningful glances. We're going to, I'm going to tell you a story today. 
I don't know if it's a <coughs> excuse me. I don't know if it's a story you know or not, but it's a true story. So there was this guy, and this guy, this guy liked. He, 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 he was trying to serve God. Yay, hi, how are you? He was trying to serve God, and he got kind of frustrated. You ever get frustrated? He got kind of frustrated, and he got kind of sad and a little bit mad, and so he decided to run out into the wilderness. He found a big cave, and he went out there, and he started praying. Now, sometimes when you pray, you might pray like very nice prayers like, Dear Father, thank you so much for... The wonderful. He didn't pray that kind of prayer. He was kind of frustrated, so his prayer was kind of like, Father, I don't like this, and people are bugging me. So, because he was, again, he was kind of frustrated. And God said, all right, I want you to come. I am going to come and visit with you. <gasps> Whoa. And then all of a sudden, this giant wind <sighs> begins to blow over the mountain, and it's not just like kind of wind, it's a big wind, it's so, the wind is so windy, it begins to blow the rocks, and they're falling down, and they're breaking, and crashing, and it's really loud, and he's like, whoa, and yet that wasn't God, and then all of a sudden, the wind's over, and then there's an earthquake, and now the whole mountain's shaking, and more rocks are breaking, and things are falling, it's really loud, and it still wasn't God. And then a fire came, and you could hear the fire roaring, and, and it rips up over the mountain, and it's loud, mount, uh, fire across, and it still wasn't God. So it's been really loud, it's been kind of scary, and then all of a sudden, the earthquake's over, the wind's over, the fire's over, and all of a sudden, there's just this little breeze. Just a gentle breeze. And God says, come on out and talk to me. And so we tend to think of God as big, scary God. And yet God was showing him that God is not always big and scary. That he's quiet and gentle. And so when God came to him, it was like a little breeze. Now, does God love you? Yeah. yeah. And a lot of times people are scared of God. And God can be big and scare people, but he doesn't want to scare you. He wants to come to you and say, shh, I'm gentle, and I love you. And so that was really good for him to learn because he was kind of frustrated with people, and God's like, yeah, but I'm not going to be rough with you. I'm going to be nice to you and quiet like a little breeze. And a lot of grown-ups still, they kind of think of God in terms of, <laughs> you know, big and scary, and yet that's not how God came to this guy came to him quiet in a breeze, nice and quiet. So I hope that you remember that you don't have to be scared of God. God doesn't want you to be afraid of him. He wants you to know that you can come to him and be safe because he loves you. And I think you guys know that, but I hope as you get bigger, you remember that. Now, if you ever want to hear about that story again, read the story. It's in the Bible. That's actually a story from the Bible, and the guy's name was Elijah. And uh, you can go and read about him in, I see either Kings or Chronicles, but that story is in the Bible. You can go find it and read it again. But I hope you remember how much God loves you and that he wants you to not have to be afraid of him. So you guys can go to Children's Church. Thank you so much for coming up. It's so good to see you today. I am told we have a reader. I'm told we have a reader. Good morning. I got to read from a paper because I can't see the Bible that good. <laughs> We're going to I'm going to be reading uh, Jude 1 to 4. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that we once were all entrusted to God's holy people. 
for certain individuals who condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped among us, among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license of immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sub in the Lord. Thank you very much, Seth. We're starting a new series today, and I will tell you that uh, I was, you know, whenever I'm getting ready to do the next series, I, I pray about it, and I say, okay, what, is, what does God want to talk about next? What, God, what do you want me to do? What, where, where are we at as a church? What would be next? And I felt like, oh, we should do Jude. Just, just, and I don't know if it was God or just my random brain or whatever, and I was like, oh, that sounds like fun. I haven't done Jude ever, and uh, so that'd be a cool thing to do. So I set it as the new plan. I'm going to do Jude, and then I read it. And I'm like, what did I just agree to do? Oh, my word. This is a tough book. <clears throat> so I, uh, I have agonized. This, sometimes prep goes easier and sometimes prep goes harder. And this has been tough because this is, this is, it's, a, it's, a, it's good. I really believe that this is where God wants us to be. But it's pretty, pretty tough. And so it may be a slightly different uh, sermon series than you're maybe used to because it's not... It's, you know, sometimes we just like the really simple sermons, both you and I both. You know, I was just say, uh, God loves you, love your neighbor. Ha, ah, amen, hallelujah. All right, so go out and do that. Okay, and we go home and we say, that's marvelous. Oh, I feel so good about church today. This is not that. And it's not going to be. As we dig into it, I, I made this point at the end of last service. I'll try to make it at the beginning of this service. Uh, always, as we dig into this, uh, and we take you through the Word of God, obviously I always give you the references, and I hope that you're reading along with me. I hope you're looking it up for yourself, because none of, the, none of what we do here can be me just saying, here's what I think, because I'm not smarter than you. I'm probably a lot less smart than many of you, and just having another opinion doesn't matter. We don't need a lot of opinions. What we need is what does the Word of God say? What does it say, not what does I say? So the whole point in going through here, I try to always structure these messages so that you can look at the text and, and see it say it for itself. And uh, so my job is to try to help the text come out, not tell you what I think about it. And so I hope that as we go through here, especially if you end up hearing things that you're like, oh, that's not what I'm used to hearing, or I, I didn't, boy, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, you don't have to agree with me. You never have to agree with me. But... I hope that you will dive into the text and say, Does, is that what it's saying here? And I'll try to show you how we get there as we go each week. So, into the book of Jude. First, we just need to introduce who Jude is. We need to understand the context of this so we understand what he's saying. So Jude is widely understood to be one of the brothers of Jesus. All right, Jesus is, you know, Mary had Jesus first because she was a virgin. All right, and then, but she and Joseph, you know, they did finish getting married and then they had a bunch more kids, the old-fashioned way, as they say. And Jude is, Jude is short for Judah, one of Jesus' brothers. Now, the interesting thing about Jesus' brothers is, you know, for three years, more or less, Jesus had this very public ministry where he traveled around Israel and the surrounding territories there in Palestine. And he did miracles, and he taught, and he drew crowds, and he did all this stuff, and got a lot of followers, and his brothers were not among them. His brothers were not impressed with his celebrity. In fact, they were embarrassed by him. They tried to get him to stop. They thought he was crazy. They thought he was making the family name look bad. His brothers were not fans. So, <clears throat> you know, they're not like, oh, that's my older brother. Isn't he great? They're like, oh, just shut up. All right. So for three years, they're not, they're not like, oh, he's the Messiah. They're like, he's crazy. But then something weird happens. After he dies, all of a sudden, these guys that thought he was nuts and an embarrassment suddenly become massive followers of him to the point of being willing to die to defend that he's God. Well, what happened? They met him after he died, and he wasn't dead anymore. And they went, oh. You know, it's kind of embarrassing. You know, like, oh, I just thought he was my big brother and kind of stupid, and then he rose from the dead and went, oh. Oh, you're not crazy. We were wrong. And so they, they became very strong uh, parts of the church and advocates for the church and advocates for Jesus, but only because they met him after he died and they went, oh, you're not dead. We were wrong. And it's a huge evidence for the fact that Jesus did historically raise from the dead in real life because if, if it was just he died and then this myth wrote up, they were like, yeah, he's crazy. We don't like this because they didn't like it when he was alive. Anyway, 
So that's Jude, just short for Judah. He's a brother of Jesus. He identifies himself here in verse 1 as a brother of James, who is the head of the Jerusalem church and one of Jesus' brothers. So, all right. In verse, so he says, he first opens this kind of with your basic introduction, those who are called beloved of God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. And then he explains why he's writing this letter, verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation. So J Jude has been write, working on a letter that was probably a big letter, probably something more like Romans or 1 Corinthians or Hebrews. He's, and he, his topic, he tells us, was he wanted to write about salvation. Now, that sounds like a nice topic. Again, this would be a good thing. It would be cool. We all like this stuff. And he says, but instead, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. So he says, I was trying to work on this big thing about salvation that we'd all like, but I felt compelled I needed to write this. And it's one chapter. It's a little, it's a note. All right, this is a note, not a letter. It's very short. And he says, but I felt I had to warn you. He's very worried about the church. And what is he worried about? Verse 4, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. All right, what in the world does that mean? So he says, all right, we have these dangerous leaders. And the first thing we notice, he says, they've slipped in unnoticed. Now, we've got to really pay attention to what this means. Think about a leader, think about a person who has slipped in unnoticed but has great influence. Does that mean, if they have great influence, that you don't know who they are? Well, of course you know who they are. If they're invisible, then they don't have great influence. Everyone knows an influencer. So these are not, that when it says they've slipped in unnoticed, it doesn't mean that they've slipped in, um, that the, the people don't know who they are or don't realize they're leaders. But he means that the, what they're unnoticed about is it's been unnoticed that they're dangerous. It's been unnoticed that they are not good leaders. He says they've slipped in and, and nobody realized that this is a problem because they slipped in unnoticed. But he's going to talk about all the way through here that these people are leaders. And what are they doing? It says they've turned grace into licentiousness. Now, there's a word that will get you some points in Scrabble. <laughs> licentiousness. I actually, I don't think you could do it in Scrabble because I don't think you have enough let tiles. You'd have to cheat. All right. But licentiousness is not a word we throw around much. Now, here's the thing about some of these words. Uh, when you're translating the Bible, when you're translating anything, translation's a little, can be a little dicey. Sometimes translation is easy, all right? Because there are certain things that we all have in common, and so no matter what language you speak, you have a word for it, like a hat or a shoe, all right? So you say, what's a hat? Well, it's a hat, or it's a chapeau, or it's a sombrero, all right? Whatever, but it, you, it, it means the same thing in every language. But then we have other things that are less tangible, and each culture and each language may have a different way of expressing that idea, because it's not, a, it's not a, just an objective object. An objective object, I guess an object by necessity is objective, isn't it? Well, there we go. Um, and so trying to take a word that one culture expresses and put that into another language is tough. And so we, we struggle with this because there's a lot of words in Greek and Hebrew that don't have a just one word English version of that. This is one of those words. So what they did is they called it licentiousness. If you don't know what licentious means, uh, I looked it up. Oops. Do I, it's not just sex. We think, so license, the, the root word is license, meaning permission to do something. If you have your driver's license, you have permission to drive. All right, if you have a business license, you have permission to have a business. So it means you have permission to do something. So licentiousness says you have permission to do pretty much whatever you want, all right, including things that might not be good. Now, the way we use useless in English is sex, all right? We have, we're, we grew up with the Puritans, we come from the Puritans, and the Puritans were really big about, you know, the kind of sex you can have and when you can have sex, if you have it at all, and just no, 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 no. And it's not just that. We tend to think of licentiousness in terms of sexual stuff. We're going to see today it includes that, but that's just a little piece, just a little piece. All right? It's not the main, not the whole thing at all. It's much bigger than that. So here's what it means. Wantonness, this is from a Greek dictionary. Wantonness, 
shamelessness, insolence. Now, insolence is another one of those words. Didn't know well, so I looked that one up too. And insolence is, quote, rude and disrespectful behavior. Now, see, that's not talking about sexual immorality. Uh, the NIV actually says sexual immorality. It's, it's not, it's too narrow a translation because it includes the way you act on all kinds of things. So it's not just talking about that they give themselves permission for sexual desires. It includes that, but also includes pride and ego, fame, riches, and all of this while insulting and tearing down others. All right? So you're, you're, you're pursuing all these different things that humans like, and you tear down and insult others while you do it. That's insolence, rude and disrespectful behavior. He says, so these guys, what does it say? It says that they are... He says, they are, uh, turn the grace of our God into that. They twist, they turn it. They twist the grace of God. That's why we call it a twisted grace. So they're taking the grace of God and twisting it. We'll come back to that idea in a minute as Jude develops it. So he gives three examples in verse 5 as to what that looks like. He says, it's actually 5 through 7. I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, were, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in the undergoing and punishment in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So three examples. First, he says, Hebrews came out of Egypt. What's the story there? Well, God delivered them. God delivered them out of Egypt. They were free, but then they did their own thing, and they didn't end up entering the promised land. Fallen angels began. They were angels. And he says, but they didn't stay, didn't hold their jobs. They abandoned it to do their own thing, and they fall. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, these were cities. This is where Lot lived. And these were cities, and their they became renowned for how terribly selfish they were. Now we, again, because we're a little sex obsessed with our culture, we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, we've even turned Sodom into a, a, a verb or noun meaning sexual sin. But Sodom and Gomorrah, read through, do a little search, go do your Bible app, whatever, search for Sodom or Sodom and Gomorrah, and look at how many times they're referenced. Almost every time they're referenced, it's not primarily about sexual stuff. It's about the fact <coughs> that they were terrible to people. And so then the sexual part was because they just treated people as um, tools, that that also included the fact that they used them sexually. But the sexual thing was just, a, again, a piece of it. It was the fact that they uh, embraced inhumanity and using people terribly. And so this is why they were destroyed. So he says, all these three, the common thing is they all start in a blessed position. Sodom and Gomorrah are not so much blessed, but they all start out in a good position of one way or another, but they pursue their own desires, and that's what does them in. They pursue their own thing. They pursue selfishness. They pursue whatever feels good for them, and in doing that, they end up destroying themselves. He says, so they're like that, verse 5 through 7. So then verse 8, he says, in, yet in the same way. So in the same way, like that, in the same way, these men also, by dreaming, wait, what does that mean? By, by dreaming. Again, we, our culture doesn't understand it that way. But their culture, that's how you heard from God. You had a dream. You had a vision. And so they're saying, God is revealed to me. Now, that's not happening in our day and time. We're not seeing that in any rallies or in any rhetoric, where God has told me the following thing. It's the same thing. By dreaming, by declaring prophecy. That's how the prophets received it. So they use that. They defile the flesh. They reject authority. And they revile angelic majesties. All right. Defile the flesh is easy. Again, they follow their desires. Again, flesh is greater than just sexual desire. It's all the desires. It's all the things of just, this is what makes me happy. This is what makes me fulfilled. It has a broad application. They reject authority. 
Now, what does that mean? I wrote any other authority. We tend to want to define rejecting authority as you shouldn't reject godly authority. But if it's ungodly authority, we're like, well, you can reject ungodly authority because ungodly authority is just wrong. Well, that sounds very noble, except it's inconsistent with pretty much the entire Bible. Because when the Bible talks about respecting authority, it doesn't specify godly authority. In fact, it specifically references bad authority. So, for instance, Peter will write in his letter, he'll say, one of the things you need to do is respect the king. Actually, it says, honor the king. Who's the king when Peter's writing that? Fun little guy named Nero, emperor of the Roman Empire. Now, if you know anything about Nero, he was very fond of Christians. They lit up his life. By which I mean he tied them to poles, doused them in gas, and used them as streetlights. That was Nero with Christians. And Peter says, honor him. Why? Because he's an authority. Now, he hates Christians. He kills Christians for sport. And Peter says, but he's an authority, and you respect authority because all authority comes from God. Look in the Old Testament with Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, I left him out. Sorry, Shad. All right. Look at Daniel. Look at Nehemiah. Look at all these different guys who served under pagan, evil rulers, and what did they do? O king, live forever. Joseph under Pharaoh, respectful. They honored non-Christian leaders. Why? Because they're an authority. And he says, you don't do that. When, when the Israel is captured and taken to Babylon, which Babylon itself is, a, is used as an example of the world's corrupt system. In Revelation, when Babylon falls, they rejoice over the fact that the world system has finally collapsed. And yet when Israel is captured by Nebuchadnezzar and dragged off in slavery to Babylon, God has Jeremiah write to him and says, while you're there, pray for the cities you live in that they would do well. Because that's where you're living. So pray for, your, pray for these places that you've been captured and taken to. He says, but they don't do that. They reject authority. They tear it down. Pretty much anything other than their own. And then the third one is, is they revile powers, angelic majest majesties. Now, this is another thing where we have a little issue. We hear angels, we hear the word angels, and we picture powerful beings with wings. A, there's nothing that says they have wings, except some cherubim, but they don't normally describe wings. B, the word angel is a very big term in the Bible and the New Testament. It means messenger. And it is used for heavenly beings. It's also used for powerful earthly beings. In fact, one of the things that sometimes pastors in the Bible are sometimes called angels. Ding! I don't have wings. All right? Yeah, I might have horns, though. Yeah, that's a different thing. But so basically, when it talks about majesties, it's talking about people who are in, powerful in leadership, whether they are angelic or earthly. Okay, and we see Daniel, uh, there's references in Daniel to um, angelic majesties that are also are earthly kingdoms. <coughs> so that's why I wrote powers, angelic and earthly. So these three all go together, and he says, so this is what they do. They defile the flesh, they reject authority, and this says, and they revile angelic majest majesties, and it includes spiritual ones. And then he makes this really amazing statement. He says, basically in 9 and 10, don't do that. What does he say? Verse 9 and 10. But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. He says, oh, the, one of the most powerful angels ever created, Michael, the archangel, even he was unwilling to call out personally the devil. And said, said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men, verse 10, revile the things which they do not understand. Now, have you seen that? Because I have. I'm going to help the devil today and we're going to... He says, don't do that. You're messing with stuff. And not even the archangel does that. He says, and said, you don't understand these men, they don't understand. And he says, and the things which they know by instinct, they're like unreasoning animals. 
And these are the things that are going to destroy them. They, they don't understand what they're doing, but they just they have a feel for it. Oh, this would be good. It's an instinct. He says, you're like an animal. You're not, you're not thinking. You're just re- reacting to the moment. He says, don't be like that. All right, that's a lot. I told you, Jude's rough. You're like, oh my goodness. We just shoveled through those first 10 verses. He's warning about these men. So let's, let's pack it up. Let's apply it. The first thing we need to do as we look at these warnings about these kind of leaders is make a note again who Jude is talking to and about and who Jude is not. And he is not talking about world leaders. That's very tempting to say, well, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, Nero, the Roman emperor, yeah, that's right. Those people outside the church, they have no respect. But Jude is writing to the church. He says, these are people that have come in among you. So it doesn't apply to pagan, outside leaders who aren't followed by the church. This is aimed at those who have gained leadership among God's people. He says, I'm writing to warn you because you're following the wrong people. We want to say, yeah, those those other, those leaders, those guys are bad. And that's not who, Jude's not warning you about them. He wasn't worried about them following the Roman emperor because they didn't. He doesn't have to warn them about don't worship the Roman Empire because they didn't. They don't need a warning to not do something they're not doing, that they're not even tempted to do. He's like, but the, you didn't notice these guys. Remember he said they crept in unnoticed. You didn't catch it. You didn't realize there's a problem here. And that's why I felt I wanted to write about our salvation, but I needed, this is more important. I need to warn you about this. So you can't put this out there. Why? What is happening in this day? Well, you see it during the time of Jesus. There were zealots because Israel was used to being Israel. They had liked being Israel, but they got captured by Babylon and then by the Medo-Persian Empire, and they kept living under other rule, and they finally were able to get back into the land, but they still were not autonomous. And then the final empire that rose was the Roman Empire, and so by the time of Jesus, they are a Roman province, and they are under the, the heel are under the thumb of the Roman Empire, and they hate it. They don't want to be under, we need to take back our country for ourselves. And so there was a massive movement to revolutionize and overthrow the corrupt, pagan, godless Romans. And that's why you have revolutionaries in the time of Jesus. There's a, I have a theory that Judas, part of why he may have betrayed Jesus, just my theory, is that he's trying to, he's, he's spent three years with Jesus. He's sees, seen Jesus have tremendous power. But Jesus seems to be holding back from confronting the real problem, which is Rome. And so Judas betrays him to get him arrested so that he'll have to fight Rome, thinking, wow, those Romans, they don't know what they've gotten themselves into now. I, I had him arrest Jesus. Ha, 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 ha. Jesus is going to totally kick their butts. And then Jesus just doesn't defend himself and lets himself be beat up and lets himself be convicted and the war doesn't start and the disciples all flee and Judas kills himself in regret. That's my theory. But we know there were at least one zealot even among the disciples and we know that Jesu bar Abbas, the one that was released in place of Jesus, was one of these revolutionaries and we know that the reason that they, when they brought Jesus to Pilate, they had to accuse him of insurrection because the, the Romans, they don't care about Jewish theological debates. He claimed to be our Messiah. I don't care. You Jews are annoying. He threatened to overthrow the empire. I'm sorry, I'm listening now. And so Pilate interviews him and says, so you think you're a king? And Jesus says, not the way you think. I was like, okay, I'm ready to let you go. And they're like, no, don't you dare. And Pilate's like, fine. <coughs> because Pilate's mandate from Roman, Rome is, we are sick of that place blowing up. Try to keep it from blowing up. So he's like, well, if I got to kill Jesus to keep, let him kill Jesus, keep it blowing up, that's worth it. Because I just don't need any more revolution because it was constantly happening. And after Jesus died, that religious fervor and that desire to overthrow Rome kept building more and more. 
until, and if you ever go out to Masada, you'll see when they fought a Jewish sect there that was trying to rebel. And so there's this, all this thing among the God's people, the Hebrews, the Jews, to overthrow, and it starts to infect the church. Now, it, it got so bad in the Roman Empire that in 70 AD, Titus comes in and goes, that's it, I'm sick of this, and he invades Jerusalem, levels the temple, and goes, finally, I'm done with these guys. We try to let you be your own little country under us. You just keep having revolutions, so I'm just going to totally destroy you. And the writers, again and again in the New Testament, warn the church, don't fall into this. That's why Peter says, honor the king. Be respectful to the authorities that are over you, because you're not there to cause a revolution. And so in the middle of this, this is what he's talking about. He says, and now you've got guys, and they crept in unnoticed by you. And they are promoting and calling out this behavior. He says, beware of those who rail against both spiritual forces and earthly authorities while excusing sin, rudeness, and the pursuit of money and power. That's what he said. That's licentiousness. And he says, but they'll call out spiritual forces and earthly authorities. He says, don't do that. You don't, call, you don't understand what you're messing with here. You don't do that. Beware of those who do that. They've crept in and they're trying to lead you. By saying, God has blessed. Because this is what Israel did. This is what happened again and again. We are God's people. Therefore, nothing bad can happen to us. We're good. And so saying, God has blessed us, so what I do is okay. You know, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. So even though, yeah, maybe it's not biblical behavior, but the cause is just. No, it's still unbiblical behavior. It's a sin, and God does not use sin as part of his kingdom to build his body. And that's why it's called twisted grace. Because what is grace? Grace is where we're not held accountable for our sins. But he says, but you don't use that to get away with evil. And what do these guys do? They withhold grace from enemies while using grace as a cover for ungodly behavior. Those people, they're like this, and we just got a no mercy, no quarter, no nothing. Well, but, you know, hey, sometimes, you, well, you know, hey, none of us are perfect. But I'm fighting for the right cause. That's grace for me. But they're sinning too. Yeah, no grace for them. They're wrong. They don't deserve grace. What's grace? Favor that you don't deserve. And then we say they don't deserve grace. So they don't deserve that which is only given to those who don't deserve. You catch the logical problem there? You don't deserve that which is given to people who don't deserve it? Okay. And that's why we call it twisted grace. He says they've taken the grace of God, and they've bent it. They've turned it into something that was never God's intent. He says, and I'm, right, I'm so worried about this that I wanted to write to you about salvation. Instead, I'm writing to you about this. Beware of these guys. He's just getting started. We're only 10 verses in. I got four weeks to go. Buckle up. I did not want to preach this. I, I was like, oh, somebody asked me after this, then why did you? I was like, well, because I feel like God wanted me to. I mean, I sort of wanted to, but I also was like, oh, I... So next week, he's, got, he's going to give us three more examples from Jewish history that we'll spend a little time on just because we, we don't know Jewish history like he did. So we'll give some background information next week. But this is a tough one. We need to be careful. And this is not just in us individuals. It's us as a church, not just Bean's Corner, but as the American Western Church, as those who call ourselves by God's name, to make sure we don't twist the grace. And we'd be careful of who is creeping in unnoticed and doing these things. It's not very hard to go and find examples online of these 
railing against angelic majesties, calling out earthly authorities, oftentimes with some very, what was the word? Insolence. Rude and disrespectful behavior of others. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. It sometimes tells us things we don't want to hear because we want to do our own thing. Lord, it is easy to look at enemies and forget that how you treated enemies was with gentleness. You came down and you even walked up to people who were engaged in active sexual sin like the woman at the well or the woman caught in adultery. And you didn't throw rocks at them and you didn't condemn them. In fact, you said you didn't come to condemn, you came to save. You told people, don't throw rocks because you're a sinner too. You did not rail against your enemies. You went out and had lunch with them, which really ticked off the religious leaders of your day. And they called you out for your tenderness towards really not very nice people. Lord, I'm sure it was so offensive when you hired a tax collector as one of your disciples the ultimate collaborator with the Roman state. And you made him a disciple in his writings we read today in your word. So Lord, help us to listen to our brother Jude as he warns us to think through the implications of how we can, without noticing, find ourselves following the wrong people. And we can allow the grace that you have given us to be twisted into something different. Make us lights in a world that is very broken, in a country that's very lost. May we be lights beckoning people towards you. Be with us as a church as we navigate this. Be with us over the next few weeks as we study this book, this challenging book. Thank you for your inspired word that we must follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing, so this afternoon we're not doing Jude. We're going to do Genesis and Romans, but it looks at, but it's going to be related because the world and church, sin and morality. I mean, the world's broken, and the world's a mess, and our country is not where it ought to be. What are we supposed to do? What is supposed to be our response? What does the Bible say? That's what we're going to dig into this afternoon. I think you'll enjoy the study. I hope you'll come at 3 o'clock and uh, join us for an hour. As we dig into that, it'll be a discussion, open time, and uh, as we look at what is it, what are we called to as Christians in this day and age? Let's stand and sing. A thousand times I failed, still your mercy. Should I stumble again? Still I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. Will above all Your glory goes beyond.
what the untwisted grace of God is, that God comes to us, not on the basis of our goodness, our worthiness, our effort, but on the basis of his goodness. He loves you. He is kind. And so despite the fact that we're really not that great and we're never as good as we ought to be, he said, I will do the hard work. I will do the work for you. And I will redeem you based on the fact that I love you and I died for you. And so the grace of God is you don't deserve it. You don't have to deserve it. You never have to live up to it. You just have to accept that he loves you and that he wants the relationship with you based on his work on your behalf. Father, as we go from here, we thank you that you love us, that you died for us, that you live for us, and that we don't have to earn you. We don't have to live up to you. We don't have to jump through hoops to get to you. We don't have to be deserving because we aren't. But you love us enough that you came in love and kindness and gentleness to call us to you. And the, what keeps us away is our pride and our ego of trying to make it about us. So Lord, help us to lay down ourselves and accept your love and your gift of, of salvation. Thank you, Father. May this week we be messengers of that grace out to our world. May we be demonstrations of that grace to this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.